Dear friends, Christ is risen. Christos Anesti. On behalf of the School of Byzantine Music of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America and its instructors, I welcome you to this kickoff episode of what will, God willing, be an ongoing series of once monthly podcasts under the title Foundations of Hymnology. My name is Nick Giannoukakis. These podcasts are intended to be more than a musical survey of Orthodox Christian ecclesiastic hymns or discussions on general matters of ecclesiastic Byzantine chant or virtual fireside chats with sister and brother chanters in America and abroad. Instead, the podcasts will entertain deep considerations of hymnography and hymnody on the plane of ecclesiology, musicology, and, as appropriate, theology. The podcasts are designed to raise the level of knowledge, address gaps in knowledge, and also nurture the ethos under which a chanter ought to operate, as a servant of the people, as the musical and hymnotic stimulant and vehicle of their prayers. The podcast and our rotating faculty aim to raise awareness about not only the how, but also the why. The theme of today's kickoff podcast is Pentecostal, as we are now formally inside the period of the Pentecost. Today, in line with this theme, we will consider the Gospel of the Sunday of the Paralytic Man inside one of its hymnotic embodiments. We will then discuss a tipikon matter that is frequently encountered in the ecclesiastic year and its historical evolution into today's accepted practice. Following this, the podcast will shine light on one of the lesser known chanters of old time who kept the authentic chant tradition alive and who raised a multitude of expert chanters who grace the analogia today in Greece, in America, and other parts of the world. Tonight, the podcast will feature Lycurgos Petridis of late blessed memory, Archon Protopsaltis of the Archdiocese of Constantinople. The last section of the podcast will normally be used as a vehicle to answer questions from you, our friends and fellows. You may send questions on all matters musical, tipicon, theological, to the email address you now see on the screen before the second Saturday of every month. Among those received, we will select those that can be answered in their sum inside this last 15-minute block in the podcast. Given that this is the kickoff podcast, there are no questions from the listeners. However, I will raise and answer a practical question many chanters ask. Do you want to be healed? My friends, in two Sundays from today, the Church presents the events that, considered together, comprise the Sunday of the Paralytic Man. The hymnology is inspired from the fifth chapter of the Gospel of St. John the Evangelist, in which he describes the miracle of healing a paralytic man. The Gospel portrayal is brief, yet the consequences of the event and the miracle are significant in its theology and its lesson to us. Briefly, the evangelist describes an event that takes place at the Sheep Gate of Bethesda, where there was a swimming or a wading pool, 
around which there were five vaulted sheds in which a multitude of sick people were lying, who were eagerly waiting there for healing. Among those waiting to be healed was a paralyzed man, bedridden for 38 years. There, patiently, with many others seeking healing of ailments, he waited for the waters of the swimming pool to be disturbed by the angel, so that he would be the first to fall into the pool in order that he could be healed. While the gospel narrative presents an inspiring portrayal, a few hymns in the Vesper and Matin servants of this Sunday are even more powerful in conveying the state of soul of the paralytic man. Among these hymns is the Doxasticon of the Vesperal Stihira. Tonight, we present this very moving Doxasticon chanted by the great Protopsaltis Charila Ostaliadoros of late blessed memory. His interpretation is modeled on that of Constantinos Pringos, who was one of his main teachers. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
Dear friends, I would like to draw to your attention to the dialogue in the hymn. Do you want to be healed? asks Jesus. And the sick man replied, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. I have spent all my livelihood on, on physicians, and no mercy has been afforded me. Carila Ostalladoros sings the reply of the paralytic man in a manner that is intended to capture a calm resignation into hope. I would like to repeat this hymnotic intention, a calm resignation into hope. The gentle flattening of the thong the and zo inside the libretto betrays the pain and resignation that the paralytic man experiences every time the water in the pool of Bethesda is stirred by the angel. He has tried for 38 years to be among the first to fall into the water in vain. Yet, as the paralytic man expresses his pain and resignation, he is calm. Somewhere deep inside his spirit, he is resigned in his hope that one day God will enable him. The hymnodist has designed the musical cadence in a manner that wisely interprets the resignation of the paralytic man into a perpetual hopeful state. The hymnotic skeleton followed by Talladoros is largely that modeled on the tradition of one of his teachers, Constantinos Pringos. It is interesting to note that Pringos sings a composite of two variations of the Doxasticon, that of Petros Peloponisios, with elements injected from the Doxasticon of Giorgios Redestinos II, who improvises on the musical cadences of the Doxasticon of Constantinos Protopsaltis. The libretto is a post-20th century evolution and inspiration of the musical passage whose skeleton was originally notated by Constantinos Protopsaltis. That it is copied and improvised by most of the Protopsalte of the period, including those of the Smyrnaic tradition, suggests that the musical passages subserving the dialogue between Christ and the paralytic man were injected into the Petros composition, replacing the Petros original. does not sing in a libretto manner, and he is more closer in improvising the phrase metered according to the notation in Constantinos and Giorgios Redestinos compared to his students. Talladoros, as one of his students, sings more liberally and has elaborated the phrase inside the chroa of the spathi. While this can stylistically approximate the intent of Pringos, it is a minor change in the intent of Constantinos. It is certainly a significant departure from the musical passage as notated by Petros. What, did this what does this inform? First, it comes to further support the thesis that much of post-Byzantine musical notation serves as a skeleton of constants passed down from generation to generation of chanters and that the received tradition can be a combination of elements from different compositions. Second, that certain parts of the skeleton could be improvised to emphasize the essence and meaning of words or dialogue. There are many other examples of such improvisation inside many hymns in phrases or of dialogue. Third, that the improvisation was strictly maintained inside boundaries established by teachers and passed down to students. 
Pringos did not stray from the metrical structure inside the Constantinos and Petros compositions. His contemporaries from recorded evidence also did not stray. Constantinos was a student of Giorgios the Cretan and Manuel Vizandios and sang inside the patriarchal church with Iacovos Protopsaltis and Emmanuel the Protopsaltis. In contrast, Petros Peloponnesios was a student of Ioannis from Trabzon, Protopsaltis, and sang with Daniel Protopsaltis as his Lambadarios. Thus, the differences in musical lineage between Constantinos and Petros can account for their stylistic choices. That Pringos sang a hybrid version of the Doxastikon, incorporating both Petros and Constantinos' musical passages embodied inside the Redestinos Doxastikon, suggests that Iakovos Naftliotis very likely sang the same. In our day, the Doxastikon of the Vespers, chanted by most Psalte of all time, is that of Pringos, for the dialogue passage has been fashioned into a libretto away from the metering of Constantinos. This libretto and spathi are post-Pringos evolutions, first seen in the publication of Karamanis in the 1970s. From that point onward, this interpretation and improvisation has all but eclipsed the original, metered interpretation of Pringos and very likely his predecessors. In spite of this, however, it maintains the essence of the calm resignation into hope, first notated inside the Petros composition. The libretto, as we heard earlier by Talladoros, does not cause sharp and abrupt actions of the spathi, but instead allows the spathi Croat to cause a gentle meandering, like a gentle wave whose crests and troughs reveal a calm pain and a gentle hope and anticipation that, inside resignation, there is hope. And then, Christ, the physician of souls and bodies, knowing that the paralytic man has hope and faith in God, responds, Take up your bed and walk, proclaim my power and great mercy to the ends of the earth. The music becomes powerfully jubilant and celebrational, and immediately after rising upwards in cadence inside the diatonic genus of plagal first mode, it quickly becomes soothing. The power of Christ transforms musically from the Doric and commanding plagal first into a very moving, soothing and warming, warming chromatic genus. The hymnodist wisely musically weaves the two essences of the power of Christ inside this transition, commanding and direct, weaved into a welcoming compassion, embracing anyone who asks to be healed. The power of Christ as a sharp surgical instrument in its Doric plagal first mode to cut out the illness, followed by the warm application of a bandage aimed to stop further damage and initiate the repairs. The power of agape inside the power of compassion and healing. Christ the physician, Christ the healer. Do you want to be healed? Dear friends, this question to the paralytic man is also addressed to each of us as chanters who are his servants in presenting his words and hymn to our fellow people in church. Let us also remember that our diakonia, our service, is not one of showmanship or technical musical prowess that are rooted in destructive ego. Our diakonia is instead one of our works, our selfless teaching, our selfless service to those lesser among us. As stewards and fellows and servants to one another, it is through our own personal faith and service and works inside him that we will be cured of our own passions, being worthy to sing to him and to praise him unto the ages. On almost every Sunday matins, instead of Ode 9 of the Resurrectional Canon, the Megalinarion, the Magnificat, more glorious than the Cherubim is sung, prefaced by specific Marian verses. On Dominical and Marian feast days that fall on Sundays, this Magnificat is replaced by Ode 9 of the Feastal Canon with different pre-verses. What is the historical basis for this? And when does Ode 9 of the Feastal Canon 
replace the Magnificat widely referred to as the Timiotera? To answer this question requires an understanding of the history of the canon and its use in the Orthodox Christian tradition. The canon is a hymnotic structure that began as an evolution of the singing of the verses of nine psalmic odes, which was an integral feature of the asthmatic rite of the non-monastic churches, and its beginning can be seen as early as the 6th century CE. The canon consists of hymns, referred to as troparia, grouped into nine odes, although early compositions can consist of as few as three or four odes. The first hymn of every ode is called the Irmos and serves as the metrical and musical template that informs the construction of the rest of the troparia in that ode. Each of the nine odes has its own Irmos. In the asthmatic rite, prominently featured was the singing of the nine biblical odes. These are Ode 1 consists of verses derived from Exodus chapter 15, which is an ode of thanksgiving that the Israelites sang immediately after crossing the Red Sea. Ode 2 consists of verses derived from Deuteronomy chapter 32. It is a very mournful ode attributed to Moses shortly before his death. Ode 3 consists of verses from 1 Kings chapter 2 and is an ode of thanksgiving uttered by the prophetess Anna when she arrested the judge Samuel. Ode 4 consists of verses from the prophetic book of Avakum, chapter 3. Ode 5 consists of verses from the prophetic book of Isaiah, chapter 26. Ode 6 consists of verses from the book of Jonah, chapter 2, attributed to Jonah when he was inside the belly of the whale. Ode 7 consists of verses from the prayer of the three children inside the book of Daniel, chapter 3, when they were being led into the furnace of the fire. Odes 8 and 9 consist of verses from the hymn of the three children again, this time while they were inside the fiery fire and miraculously saved, again found inside the book of Daniel, but this time in chapter 4. The ninth ode is the only ode whose verses are not from the Old Testament. Ode 9 consists of two smaller odes, First, the Ode of the Theotokos attributed to her when she met Elizabeth, the mother of St. John the Forerunner, verses found in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 1, and then the Ode of the Prophet Zacharias, pronounced by the priest Zacharias, the father of St. John the Forerunner, when St. John was born. These verses are found inside the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 1. This asthmatic rite developed inside the Church of Jerusalem at least as early as the 4th century and eventually was adopted by the Studium Monastery in Constantinople by the 7th century, spreading throughout the Christian communities soon thereafter. After each of the verses of an ode, a refrain was sung. This refrain was either one of the Old Testament verses or a verse inspired by the theme of that particular ode. Concerning Ode 9, the refrain to the passages from the Gospel of St. Luke chapter 1 was inspired by the Marian theme and its earliest embodiment was we magnify in hymns the Theotokos, in Greek, Tim Theotokon and Imnis Megalinomen. This is evidenced in the earliest known manuscript that presents this refrain, currently located in the Moscow State Historical Museum inside the Hludov Psalter, dated to about 850 CE. In the 3rd century CE, this refrain evolved into more honorable than the cherubim and incomparable to all the heavenly hosts, in Greek, timiotera ton cherubim kia singritos pason ton uranion stration, and this refrain has been attributed to Saint Ephraim the Syrian. By the 7th century CE, Saint Cosmas the Melodist, inspired by this Ephraimite verse, offered an elaboration of a refrain that today is the well-known Timiotera, more honorable than the cherubim. The asthmatic rite indicated that the refrain of every verse of a specific ode also be used as a pre-verse, proimnion, of that specific ode. Concerning the pre-verse, refrain of Ode 9, in the asthmatic rite, the presiding deacon would sing it immediately before the singing of Ode 9 by the choir. This archaic practice remains to this day, when the deacon or the priest sings the most recent evolution of the older pre-verse refrain, we magnify in hymns of Theotokos, 
which today is let us honor and magnify in song the Theotokos and the Mother of Light in Greek, Tim Theotokon ke mitera tu fotos and imnis timondes megalinomen. The oldest extant evidence of this structure of the ninth ode in the Asmatic Rite is recorded, as noted earlier, in the Kludov Psalter. The structure of the verses of the ode evolved from the 7th century onward, especially in the developing monastic rite that would eventually eclipse the older asthmatic rite. Here, the refrain of every ode inspired a slightly longer, metrically arranged short poem that referred to the biblical theme of that ode. The first in sequence encountered refrain hymn of every ode retained the name Irmos, but hymnographers now composed more troparia for that ode, where each of the troparia was metered on the Irmos, with the existing refrains serving as the ending of those troparia. The term canon was applied beginning in the 7th century, chiefly by the hymnographer monks of the monastery of St. Savas in Jerusalem, as well as by the studite hymnographers, to classify the collection of the Irmos and the metered troparia that comprised all the nine odes. With the proliferation of troparia metered on the Irmos, the Old Testament verses were now repurposed as pre-verses of the troparia in each of the nine odes. This is true even for the ninth ode, where the passages from the Gospel of St. Luke, previously sung as odal verses, were now repurposed as pre-verses for the troparion more honorable than the cherubim that is well known and sung today. Between the 7th to the 11th century CE, almost all the canons for the principal feast days of the church, especially the Dominical and the Marian, were composed and consecrated for ecclesiastic use. The asthmatic rite practice of using the Old Testament verses as pre-verses for the canon troparia of every ode remained in practice. Given the importance of the Dominical and Marian feast days, it was only natural that Ode 9 of that feastal canon would replace the usual Sunday Ode 9, whose refrain is more honorable than the cherubim. Thus, for the Dominical and Marian feast days, instead of the pre-verses from the Gospel of St. Luke and the refrain more honorable than the cherubim, the feastal Ode 9 troparia are sung and used as pre-verses the verses of another hymnotic structure that came into ecclesiastic use around the 10th century CE, a hymnotic structure known as the Megalinarion, the Magnificat. In practice today, in the principal Dominical and Marian feast day, the troparia of Ode 9 are sung with the pre-verses from their respective feastal Megalinaria. <laughs>
Λικούργος Πετρίδης, άρχον πρωτοψάλτης of the Holy Archdiocese of Constantinople. Λικούργος Πετρίδης was born in Tatavla, Constantinople in 1923. From the age of just 10, he ascended to the Psaltic lectern, the Analoia, of the Patriarchal Church of St. George at the Fanar. He was fortunate enough to listen to the great Psalte of Constantinople, Iacovos Nafliotis, Ευστάθιος Βιγκόπλος, Βασίλειος Ονουφριάδης, Κωνσταντίνος Πρίγκος, and Θρασίβουλος Στανίτσας. His uncle, Πρωτοπρέσβητερ Ιωάννης Γαλάνης, taught him his first steps inside Byzantine chant. At the same time, he also studied with the Πρωτοψάλτε Νικόλαος Ρεδαστινός, Βασίλειος Ονουφριάδης, Κωνσταντίνος Πρίγκος, and Γιώργιος Παπαδόπλος, whom he served as first domesticos. His ephos, that is, his musical style and expressivity, was informed and inspired by Thrasivulos Stanitsas. From 1941, he served in Constantinople as the second and the first domesticos inside the Holy Church of Evangelistria, of the Tatavla foothills, and second chanter in the Holy Church of the Transfiguration in Sisli. In 1958, he settled in Thessaloniki and took over as lead singer and choir master at the Church of the Divine Transfiguration of Calamaria, where he chanted continuously until his retirement in the mid-2000s. He is a graduate of the Macedonian Conservatory of Thessaloniki, graduating in 1968. He wrote and published many volumes of a musical series entitled The Vizandina, as well as music for the services of more than 40 saints. He was the director of his own Byzantine choir, which participated in many musical events and concerts, as well as in the Dimitria festivals of Thessaloniki, and he also appeared with his choir on Greek television. He recorded himself on tape interpreting older and newer compositions, which he graciously gave to many students and musicophiles over his decades, serving the church and serving as a teacher. Many of his students are among the most traditional interpreters of the Psaltic tradition in the manner of the Mother Church. For his contribution to liturgical music, in 1985 he was honored by the Municipal Council of Calamaria, which in a special ceremony awarded him a special silver plaque. The Ecumenical Patriarchate awarded him the Officion of Archon Protopsaltis of the Holy Archdiocese of Constantinople, and in addition honored him with a golden cross. Graced with a rare melodic voice and a serious, sacred musical style, Likurgos Petridis remains, even though a generally lesser-known chanter, a prominent musician and an excellent man who offered his worthy musical work to the church and to his fellow chanters and students with great modesty. He remains one of the protopsalte of old time and guardian of the authentic received tradition of Byzantine chant in the ethos of the Mother Church.
Does the chanter always stand on the same level of the stasidion? Are there any moments where the chanter traditionally steps down to a lower level of the stasidion, even to the floor level? The answer is yes. According to the tradition of the Great Church of Christ, the protopsaltis, the lambadarios, together with the two domestici, stand a step lower at the following moments in what one could consider to be a regular Sunday church service at Vespers, Matins, and Holy Liturgy. At Vespers, when the Protopsaltis sings Ispolaeti at the Hierarch's arrival at the Solea, and throughout the duration of the start of the Vespers until the end of the verses, come let us worship and bow down before God our King. During the chanting of the Theotokia Parthene hymns in the compunction at Sunday Vespers, at the point close to the dismissal when the priest says wisdom, Sophia, and for the duration of the hymn, Ton Despotin Kerchierea, if there is a hierarch. At Matins, at the start of the Matins, at the reading of Heavenly King Comforter, for the duration of the reading of the six Psalms up to the end of the Apolititia, at the hymn of the Evlogitaria that is preceded by the pre verse, Glory to the Father, we bow down in worship to the Father and His Son. At the arrival of the Hierarch, and for the duration of when the Protopsaltis sings Ispolaeti at the Hierarch's arrival at the Solea, at the reading of the prayer, having beheld the resurrection of Christ, and then for the duration of the start of the chanting of the 50th Psalm, until the verse, Behold, you love truth, you showed me the unknown and secret things of your wisdom. At the ninth ode, that is the Timiotera, However, not when the Timiotera is replaced by a festal canon old nine. At the Exapostilaria, only the Lambadarios and the Domestici of the left side chorus step down from the Stasidion. During the singing of Ton Despotin Kerchierea, at the Louds, during the singing of Enite, praise him all you his angels, whenever there is a hierarch on the throne, for the duration of the great doxology. Now at the liturgy, at the sotart point of the liturgy, blessed is the kingdom of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, at the reading of the gospel, for the duration of the verse Oston Vasilea, so that we may receive the king of all during the cherubic hymn, for the duration of same Numen, we praise you, we bless you, we give thanks to you, and for the entirety of the Axionestin, it is truly right to bless you Theotokos. For the duration between proschomen, let us be attentive, and isaios iskirios, one is holy, one is Lord Jesus Christ. At the incantation of metaphovu theou, with the fear of God, faith, and love draw near, and for the duration up to the end of idomentophos, we have seen the true light. For other services and sacraments, there are additional times when the psalte and the domestici step, the step down, and this could be a question that we would be very happy to answer in a future podcast. Dear friends, thank you for joining us tonight. We pray that you and your ministry is graced with strength and felt as you chant to him, conveying the people's prayers. Christ is risen. Christos Anesti. Truly, he is risen. Sir.